Matthew 22 and verse 8. Now, the first part of this is not in your notes, but the Bible says that the that the uh, the king sent out servants to invite people to a dinner, and when he went to the servants went to the to these people, some of them mocked and made light of it, and they just kind of brushed it off like it's no big deal. And others took the servants and evilly entreated them and killed them. <clears throat> In verse 8 it says, Then saith he, the king, to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he, the guest, was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called but few are chosen and so my lesson tonight is many are called but few are chosen uh, I think it is important and probably those of you here tonight uh, I don't know that you're going to hear anything you haven't heard before but there is a misconception in Christianity at large and is summed up in a very familiar mantra faith alone grace alone Christ alone and it has a wonderful sound and rings with such simplicity however underneath the words is a deep disagreement with the meaning of those words and what the Bible actually teaches about salvation in Ephesians 2 and 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, what's it say? Unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so the Bible never teaches or uses the word alone in the context of salvation. Faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone. You will not find that, that idea communicated in the scripture. In fact, I put it in here just because I thought it needed to be said, though I've said it before. The only time you find faith and alone in the same scripture is James 2 and 17 even so faith if it hath not works is dead being alone so when we say we're saved by grace through faith I actually was pondering this uh, early in the morning last week as I walked up the stairs to get my exercise on as my brain does as a preacher I'm thinking about a scripture and uh, mulled it in my brain and I'm walking up the stairs saved by grace through faith I'm saved by grace through faith and so uh, I, I'm thinking about that word saved by grace through faith and so I have available to me a third level on that building but how do I get up that, to that third level? It's grace. Grace gives me the ability to get up there. But faith walks up those steps. So I'm saved. I am elevated by the stairs through my effort walking up those stairs. So I'm saved by grace through faith. And so faith is the, the action 
that causes grace and its effect to be enjoyed. Does that make sense? Saved by grace through faith. So faith is vital. The Bible says whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Faith is necessary. Faith is crucial. Faith is mandatory. You cannot be saved by faith. And I think the thing we have to uh, deal with, Brother Noah, is what is faith? If somebody asked you that, what is faith? Brother Noah, how would you answer that question? What is faith? That's, that's really close. Believing without seeing. I think that's, that's a valid answer. Anybody else? How would you define faith, Brother Jason? Seeing those things. You see something you can't see. Okay. Anybody else? Sister Tammy, what is faith? Ditto. I like that. I like that. Faith. The Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So you you believe in something you cannot see. And it is so real that it is a substance. Faith is the tangible for the intangible. It is the real for the unseen. It is the substance. And, and faith is no doubt uh, what motivates us. It, uh, we come to church because we believe there is some tangible benefit that we receive. Right? We pay our tithes and give in the offering because we believe there is some tangible benefit that we receive uh, through that worship. We... we, we we should not do it out of obligation or requirement or out of fear, but it's by faith. Whatever you do, do it in faith. If you're writing a check or you're worshiping the Lord or clapping your hands, you don't get any benefit if you do it for any other reason than if you do it in faith. If you do it in faith, that's where the blessing is. The blessing's in the faith. So faith is our watchword. It is our motivation. We believe in God, in his word, in his plan, in his will, in his blood, in his name. We believe in it. How much do we believe in it? We come to church. We pay our tithes. We clap our hands. We raise our hands. We, we assemble together. We, 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 we've been baptized, and we encourage other people to be baptized. We believe, the Bible says, that if a person repents of their sins and they are immersed in water in the name of Jesus Christ, that they receive the forgiveness of sins, and we believe that the Lord will fill them with his Holy Spirit, and when they receive his Holy Spirit, they will speak in a language they have never learned. That's, wow, you, yeah, we believe that. We practice that. We encourage it, and it's amazing. You get what you preach. People get baptized. Their life is affected. We pray for them. We see people get the Holy Ghost. They speak in a language they never learned. Somebody said, praise God. We believe that, and we have seen it to be more than just something that we believe in that we can't see. We believe in it because we have seen it. And so faith, we are saved by grace through faith. I, I, I thought about the different ways you can make an analogy concerning grace and faith. And I thought about grace is the vehicle, and faith is is the engine or you could say grace is the vehicle and the engine and faith is the gas and the spark plugs it it is faith that makes grace work for us grace is available to everyone yet everyone does not benefit from grace because they do not activate their faith for that and so it is when we hear the word and we obey the word that our faith is manifested, proven. People know what we believe based on what we do. If you believe in the lottery, you know what you do? You buy lottery tickets. It's a fact. 
If you believe gas will get your car moving down the road, you go to the gas station and you buy gas. And lo and behold, gas works better than lottery tickets. Just FYI. If you believe in something, someone can watch your life and see. You know, they really believe this stuff. I mean, you think about it. As someone who makes $1,000 and pays tithes on $1,000 they are writing a check for a hundred dollars and they are writing that check and they're writing it to a church and they truly believe that they're going to be better with a hundred dollars less why would they do that because they believe God blesses a cheerful giver so someone could look at your checkbook and say wow they really believe that amen so faith Faith isn't just something that we think about. Faith is not just a knowledge of a thing, but faith is, is something that can be visible from other people when they look and watch our life. Faith is the visible of the invisible. Amen. I can tell you what I believe, and you can know it by watching what I do. <clears throat> Some people say they believe in heaven, but they live like the devil. Come on, somebody. So let's look at Titus 2 and 11. It's on the second page of your notes. It says, For by grace, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. You know, there are some people believe that God did not, Jesus did not die for all souls. They, there are people that even though the Bible says the grace of God that appears to all men, though the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, there are people that truly believe that Jesus only died for the ones he chose. And so if Jesus died for you and Jesus chose you, then there you have no effect on whether you're going to be saved. And so they truly believe that if Jesus died for you and Jesus chose you, there is nothing you can do to be saved and there is nothing you can do to be unsaved. And, uh, well, we know the Bible doesn't teach that and this scripture shows that. It's Titus 2 and 11, for the, by the, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. What does grace do? Verse 12. Somebody want to read that for me? Titus 2 and verse 12. Brother Nate? That's right. So the grace of God that bringeth salvation appears to all men, and it teaches us that we should deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people that are fervent, zealous, excited, and uh, exemplify good works. Amen. Good works. So grace is everything God has done and will do towards me and you to see us saved from hell and brought into heaven. And so everything grace, everything God has done towards mankind throughout the Bible, it can be defined as grace. The story of Adam and Eve, the Lord told them not to do what? Anybody? What? The Lord told Adam and Eve, don't eat from the fruit of what tree? From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They could eat from all the trees in the garden except one tree. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the Lord said, don't eat it. When the Lord uh, told Adam that, later when Adam told Eve, Adam told Eve, don't touch it. I've heard someone say that's the first biblical standard. God said, don't eat it. 
Adam said, let's just play it safe and let's not touch it. So, if God said don't do it, Adam said don't touch it, what happened? They disobeyed God. What caused them to disobey God? There was this serpent. That, I don't guess he slithered. He had feet at that point. He walked into the garden, standing there by the tree, and he began to ask questions concerning the word of God. And uh, there's nothing wrong with asking questions if you're willing to accept the answers. But oftentimes in areas of faith and hope in God and the Bible, when people start asking questions, that's not motivated out of a desire to know. It's motivated from a desire to cause you to doubt it. Oh, why won't you have it? Don't you see? That it's, it'll make you wise. And uh, no, uh, God uh, has said that we'll die if we eat it. And the serpent just added one word not he disputed and disagreed and caused Eve and I would say to some degree Adam to doubt that maybe God was lying to them maybe that what God's word said wasn't without dispute and so she who would before have not eaten of it who before would not have touched it she began to look at it and she said "Ooh, that really does look good and, you know, I always wanted to be smarter than I am. Wanted to make one wise. And uh, good for food. Make one wise. What's the third one? There's a third one. There's three. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life. And so she took of the fruit. She ate the fruit. And Adam's standing there right beside her. Uh passive fellas he took the fruit chewed on it and something happened their eyes were open and oh Eve look at you she looked at Adam and said look at you put your clothes on boy put your clothes on girl and they realized they were ashamed of the fact they didn't have any clothes on. So they went and got them some leaves. They sewed them together and they're, you know, dealing with a new reality. They had knowledge of good and evil. And they hear the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hide themselves. And the voice of the Lord says, Adam, where are you? We know God knew where Adam was. Adam just didn't know where he was. And finally, Adam says, uh, I heard your voice. And I was afraid because we're naked, naked, naked. They, they have no clothes on. <laughs> and the Lord says, who told you where you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? And uh, they began to point fingers. Adam pointed fingers at Eve. Eve pointed fingers at the serpent. And the Lord cursed them all. And if the Lord would have brought about the judgment he had intended and had communicated they would have died that day but rather than killing them he instituted a substitute and we know there was a substitute because the Bible says that God clothed the nakedness of Adam and Eve through giving them coats of skin so there were two animals that died that provided their skin, their fur, to be a coat to cover their nakedness. And that's the first example of grace in the Bible, that the Lord gave them time they did not deserve, and covered their shame they did not deserve, and allowed them to live and experience life outside the garden. And from that story all the way through the Bible, everything God did toward mankind is the definite is what grace is. Some people say grace is unmerited favor. It's like tell it saying that my car is blue. 
Yeah, but my car, well, my car's, my, my car's not a car. My, car, my tr- car's a truck. My car is silver. My truck is more than silver, and grace is more than unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. It's what people say. Grace is saying you don't deserve it. Of course you don't deserve grace, but grace is more than just something you don't deserve. Grace comes in many forms. The grace of God that brings salvation that appears to us convicts us, and thank God for conviction. I, it is my opinion that conviction is the greatest gift he will ever give to us because it is grace that causes us to see our need to repent. You want to begin to pray for someone in your family or someone you love and you want them to be saved? Pray for God to convict their heart because conviction is the feeling we have when grace begins to work on our life. The grace, it causes us to say, I need God and that can manifest itself in many ways but ultimately grace some people the way they preach grace I put it this way there are people that will go to a denominational church every Sunday and that they're perfectly fine they, they, they leave church feeling better about themselves without having to do anything different they was drinking on Friday they'll be drinking on Tuesday and they went and sang Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound on Sunday. They can go to church and there is no feeling, I need to repent, I need to change. And people like that. But they can come to a spirit-filled, Bible-preaching church and the spirit of grace is there and that grace causes them to say, I need to change something in my life. They can't come into a church that is preaching truth and, and leave thinking I'm all right when they're not, they're not all right. And so many times people would say, well, I don't want to go to that church because I don't feel good when I leave. Well, they would feel good if they'd repent. And so many times, that's the challenge so many times uh, is that we live in a very religious society and, and people, the Bible says that the time will come people will not endure sound doctrine, but they will they'll look for people to tell them what they want to hear do you know that preachers will tell you what you want to hear I mean if you want to (laughs) you can do any you can find someone to tell you you're all right to do anything today there's I mean there are people a a friend of mine uh, had someone in his church say to him I wish that we could just some of our preachers could be more like Joel Osteen have I mentioned this from the pulpit and I said that I might not have said it and so my friend said okay though he thought it was ridiculous he said you know okay I'm gonna listen to Joel Olstein." and so for three months he listened to Joel Olstein's podcast and he listened to his preaching for three months and over a period of three months he never mentioned sin he didn't mention victory over sin he didn't mention repentance from sin he didn't mention forgiveness over sin. He never mentioned sin one time in 90 days. No wonder people like him. I mean, what's not to like? I'm fine just the way I am. I'm a winner. I can overcome. I'm great. I'm all that in a bag of chips without repenting of my sins. And the world is looking for that. And sometimes people will will uh they'll see all this religious stuff and they can it's easy to become confused when people that that they talk the religious talk i love jesus i believe in jesus i love i i I read my bible and they have all of these accessories that fit into the life of faith and there is sincerity they have they truly have sincerity but they haven't if our gospel be hid it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world had blinded the eyes of their mind lest they would see the glorious gospel in the face of Jesus Christ in the book of revelations John speaks of a moment when he sees the harlot which we understand is the uh, the church of the world the Catholic Church in particular And it says, I looked and I beheld the harlot and I wondered at her. He was amazed while looking at the harlot. 
And if you look at Catholicism and its daughters, you see wealth, you see golden buildings, great crowds, and all manner of the accoutrements, great word, I can't spell it, but the accoutrements of successful religion. But what they are preaching isn't what we're preaching. Amen? And it's very important for us to recognize that what we have been saved by and what will save the people that we love is a message of truth that what grace truly is. Grace is wrapped up and can be summed up in the parable that we read at the beginning of this lesson. There is an invitation made. Many people that were invited laugh at it. Other people that were invited persecuted it. And finally, a general call was made to everyone that just the Lord wanted everybody to be. He wanted to have a full house at the wedding. But even in that place, these, this, this individual showed up. So they got invited and they came. But in the coming, they, didn't, they were not properly prepared prepared for that wedding and the Lord went to him and said friend how is it that you have no wedding garment and the man was speechless and the Lord the king I would say to you Jesus said bind him hand and foot and cast him into hell so it is possible for someone to hear the call and even show up but because they do not put on the garment they will be cast into hell and the Lord wraps it up with a scripture I have heard quoted many times as well as you and I have considered it but probably not as much as I did today many are called but few are chosen and, and in that setting, it's not enough to be called. We have to qualify ourselves after we've been called. And the qualifying of ourselves is found in our response of putting on the wedding garment. And, and with that, I'm going to wrap it up in Revelations 19 and 8. says and this may not be in your notes and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen speaking of the bride clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints everybody say the righteousness of the saints the amplified says she has been permitted to dress in fine radiant linen dazzling and white for the fine linen signifies represents the righteousness the upright just godly living deeds and conduct and right standing with God of the saints God's holy people the contemporary English version says she will be given a wedding dress made of pure and shining linen this linen stands for the good things God's people have done Young's literal And there was given to her that she be arrayed with fine linen, pure and shining, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And it literally means, translated, a righteous act or deed. And it takes us to Ephesians 5 and 27. That he may present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Many are called, but few are chosen. And even in our pursuit of preaching the gospel, whether the Lord uh, gave us uh, the ability to translate this to an email that every person in the world received, uh, a Facebook Live video where everybody in the world actually watched more than five seconds, uh, able to put it on the radio or put it on television or whatever media, if we could, could have a net that literally all the world could hear it. They were called. The call of grace appears to all men. But it is the response of grace that will 
qualify them. In the opening text that I read you, the Jesus said, and, and this really stood out to me, but they which were bidden were not worthy. In verse 14, many are called, but few are chosen. I want to be worthy. I want to be chosen. And I believe I'm preaching to the the frozen chosen tonight. <laughs> you, amen. I believe we have people in our church that love God. Amen. Hate the devil. Love righteousness. Hate wickedness. We want to serve God and rebuke the devil. And I'm glad to be a part. I'm glad I'm not in this by myself, brother. Brother Jason Smith. Amen. I know. I, you know, Jeremiah got to feeling sorry for himself and said, you know, I alone am serving God. And the Lord had to say, no, you ain't. There's more. You just don't know them all. And I'm glad. I'm glad to go to an apostolic church that preaches the truth, that stands for righteousness and endeavors to, together, that we together could be called, chosen, and faithful. Because that's who's going to come back with Jesus. Called, chosen, and faithful. And I'm glad. I, I, I've heard the call. How about you? Amen. I want to make myself chosen. I want to be faithful till that last 